welcome you to our online sermon series in 1 Peter. It's been a fabulous study. We've got one more sermon next week, last one in the study. Hope you haven't missed it. it. It's been a great study and we've been glad to be a part of it. Today we're going to look at 1 Peter 5 verses 8 through 11 called Dueling with the Devil or Lying on the Prowl. Verse 8 says, Be a sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. After you suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this word. We need, we need it more than we think we do. So wake us up to your truth. Wake us up to what you're calling us to be. Wake us up to, to, to respond to that today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be the nicest, gentlest, kindest person around, but you have enemies. Jesus said, told us to love our enemies. There would be no reason to tell us that if we didn't have enemies. You cannot go through life without making enemies. And we have an enemy of this Christian life. We have an adversary, a, a, the, the devil, Satan. It's called here adversary, which is, refers to vicious, relentless hostility by a person. And devil means, actually means slanderer. So Satan, devil, whatever you want to call him, he is our enemy. And he's a powerful enemy. C.S. Lewis said two mistakes a Christian makes about Satan is one, we joke about him. Put him in a little red suit, a little red pitchfork, little horns, and we, we have a caricature of him that nobody can take seriously at all. Or, secondly, we ignore him. Satan would just assume we ignore him and let him work behind the scenes and work in our lives. But we don't want to do either one. We do not want to joke about him. We don't want to ignore him. The command here is to be alert, to be watchful, to stay awake. It's a command. I wonder if Peter had stayed awake, what would have happened? When Jesus took him to the Garden of Gethsemane and said, Stay here and pray because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I wonder if Peter had stayed awake if he would have ran when all the other disciples ran. I wonder if he had stayed awake and prayed if he would have denied he knew Jesus three times. I wonder that if he stayed awake. Satan is a powerful enemy because he's unseen, not easily recognized. He's powerful, like a roaring lion. Several years ago, I was invited to go to South Africa with a college group from First Baptist Denton. I had a, a group of students that I worked with, and we went from village to village witnessing, sharing the gospel of Christ. Uh, on the last night there, we went to the game preserve. And at night, you go out and you go in these large all-terrain vehicles, and we saw giraffes, we saw water buffaloes, we saw good news, we saw Reeboks, those kind of things. But, we also came upon a rare sight, a male lion, a female lion, and three cubs. And they, and they what came out to us, and we, the guy parked the all-terrain vehicle, and the lion crossed the road, came right up to our vehicle. And it was, uh, and everybody talking about how cute the little lion cubs were and all that. And all of a sudden, this lion, this male lion, let out a roar. I mean, it's one thing to hear that on a movie screen. It's another thing, it's natural habitat. It was spine tingling. I mean, it was it was scary. It was, it was scary. And uh, when he did, the driver said, "I think we need to move on." And I said loudly, "I think you're right. Let's, let's move." Uh, I thought about that later. He could easily jump in that all-terrain vehicle. And the driver had a rifle, but I don't think it's done much good. So he, he's powerful enemy. His power is in his deception. Second Corinthians eleven fourteen says, "For even Satan himself disguised himself as an angel of light." And he wanted to be God. He, he was a cherub, a high-ranking cherub, one of God's closest ones. And he wanted to be God. He didn't want to be second, rate, second man. He wanted to be God. So he disguises himself as much like God as he possibly can. An angel of light. That, if, I, if I understand that right, that means if he were walking in, us, in this room today, we'd be tempted to fall down and worship him. He would be that deceptive. And that would be our temptation. John 8, 44 says there's no truth in him. He's a liar and the father of lies. He promises what he cannot deliver. When Jesus was in the wilderness, he's tempted by Satan three times. One of the temptations was that he showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world in a moment's time and said, 
All these have been given to me, and I will give it to you if you fall down and worship me. But was it his to give? It wasn't his to give. Psalm 24 1 says, The earth is the Lord and all it contains. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains. He may have, he was trying to give something he didn't have to give. He may have promised that he could not deliver. That's his deception. I'm sure the kingdom of the world would look good to someone, It'd be something somebody would want, but he could not deliver it even if even if Jesus had bowed down to him and worshiped him, he could not have given those to him because it's not his to give. Of course, the biggest deception I think of all is that the one that says that you will be the exception. In other words, he, 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 there may be consequences of this sin, but not with you. Maybe things that, that Pete, you can't get away with, but you can get away with. You will be accepted. He's, he's powerful in his deception. He's also powerful in his accusations. He accuses God before man. To go to the Garden of, of Eden where God created Adam and Eve. He comes in and says, hey, you got all these fruit trees here. God won't let you eat any of this fruit. She said, no, no, we can eat any of the fruit of any tree. We won't accept this one, tree of knowledge of good and evil. And he said, well, you can eat of that. He said, no, we'll, we'll die. No, you will not die. God knows that when you eat of it, you will be like him, knowing good from evil. He doesn't want you to be like him. So he accuses God before man. He accuses man before God. Satan is uh, prowling around. He comes to counsel where God is me, his angel is God says to him, have you seen my servant Job? There's no one like him in all the earth, as righteous, as holy as he. And what does Satan do? He says, well, Job, does Job fear God for nothing? Put forth your hand now and touch all he has. He will surely curse you to your face. He accuses man before God. And all of this is he's looking for someone to devour. We need to understand that we can't be devoured. Sin, unconfessed, not dealt with, will eat you up. It will eat you up. You, you gotta be careful here. We we have a powerful enemy. So how we do it with the devil? Well, there's several things that we can do, need to do. One is we need to flee sometimes. Joseph was sold by slavery by his brothers who were jealous of him. He ends up in Potiphar's house, a, a, a high-ranking official in Egypt. And he does such a good job of managing things that, that Potiphar puts him in charge of his whole household. I mean, she's alone sometimes in the house. Well, Potiphar's wife kept trying to make advances to Joseph. One day, she catches him in the house, him by himself. And she says, come to bed with me. And he says, no, I cannot do that to my master. I cannot say against God, my master. I cannot do that. She was, she was persistent. Come on, come on, come on. So finally, he ran. He ran. Fled out of the house as fast as he can. There are times that we need to get out of the path of temptation. We need to get out of the way of sin. We need to run. Get away from it. But you don't run just from something. You run something to something. We run from sin to God. We run from sin to Jesus. And we need to flee. Then we need to resist. Resist. That's what we're told here. Resist the devil. And in James 4, 7, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Isn't that amazing? We flee from him, but we, we resist him. He flees from us. And you don't have to sin. You don't have to sin. And I, and I like, you know, when I was growing up, one of my favorite shows was Flip, Flip Wilson's show. <laughs> it was hilarious. He had his character, Geraldine. And she would always say, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. No, he can't make you do anything. If you do it, you do it. <laughs> you don't have to sin, especially as a Christian. You have the Holy Spirit within you, and you have the ability not to sin. It's not, you don't have to sin, but you have to resist. You have to resist. Now, of course, we also need to use the right weapon. We need to use the sword of the Spirit. That's a part of the armor in Ephesians chapter 6, which is the Word of God. You notice every time Jesus was tempted, he said, It is written. It is written. It is written. If he used the authority of God's Word to defeat Satan, why do we think we don't need to? And one of the reasons that we're not more successful in spiritual battles than we are is because we don't know what God said. We don't spend time in God's Word. You haven't learned God's Word. You don't know what God says. You, you need to be reading it every day, every day, and letting God speak to you and claiming the promises of Scripture, claiming the strength of Scripture, because it's powerful. And it's more powerful than Satan. It is written. It is written. That's what we need to live by. Knowing truth. And knowing truth, Satan has no power over us at all. And we need to fear God. We need to fear God. You know, a lot of people don't like this idea of fearing God. But it's a healthy fear. Uh, I believe in healthy fears. I don't carry around 
uh, uh, screwdriver and stick them in the wall sockets because I'm afraid of electricity. I don't step in front of a bus going 60 miles an hour because I'm afraid of that bus. That's healthy fear, healthy fear. God, God doesn't want us terrified of him. He wants us to love him. He wants us to know he loves us. He doesn't want us to know that he is to be feared. And it said, Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul. Rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. God has the authority to send you to hell. He can destroy it. He can complete it. Proverbs 1, 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You want wisdom, you want understanding, you need to fear God. That, that's, that's the beginning of it all. You need to fear God. Who, who do you fear? Why do you fear? You have an enemy, but you do not need to fear him. See, you, we talk about dueling with the devil, but you don't really duel Satan. I mean, he, he is, he's not as powerful as some of us make him, but he's more powerful than many of us claim he is. But we cannot beat him. We cannot beat him. But he is a defeated and destroyed enemy. Jesus did it for us. Jesus already won the duel. First John 3, 8 says, The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. So when he appeared, he, at the cross, when he was nailed to the cross, Satan thinking he's won has actually lost because their sin is dealt a death blow. But at the cross, Jesus came and he gave his life. He shed his blood that we might be bought for, for the kingdom of God, that we might belong to him. We'll, we'll duel with him. He, we'll let Jesus duel, duel with him. We, we claim ourselves who we are in Christ. And God is at work to, says here in verse, one, verse uh, 10, God is at work to perfect you, to bring you to completion, to make you mature, complete. He's, he's at work to confirm you. That means to confirm who you are and, and what, you, what you are in Christ. You know, part, part of our strength is knowing who we are, knowing who we belong to. Because Satan can come to me, you know, he can remind me of things I've done in the past and, and accuse me and say, you're worthless, how can anybody do stuff like that? And all I got to say is, yeah, that's who I was, but it's not who I am. It's who I am in Christ Jesus is what matters now. That's who I am. And, uh, and so he's confirming you and he's strengthening you. The word here means to make sturdy. He'll make you strong, able you to stand. And he will establish you. It means to lay a foundation. That foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ. Came into this world, died for our sin, rose from the dead. We might have everlasting life. And he rules forever and ever. I love the way this ends, don't you? All dominion. Yeah. Satan is not going to rule forever and ever. He doesn't have dominion. No world leader is going to rule forever and ever. Only Jesus is going to rule forever and ever. And, and he, he is our, our, our victory. Our victory. Do you have the victory? Uh, you're going to struggle in this world. You're going to struggle. You're going to have difficult times. There's no way of escaping that. It's going to be there. But you have an enemy, but you have a victim. You have victory in Christ Jesus. You have one who's conquered him. And you need to claim who you are in Christ. You need to claim that you are a child of God. That you are adopted into his family. That you belong to him. Nothing else. And Satan cannot touch you. He cannot, cannot have you. He cannot claim you. You are who you are in Christ. Claim that now. If you've not made that decision to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, to receive Him, follow Him, this is absolutely crucial because you're, you're not going to live forever and ever without Christ. You're not going to have abundant life without Christ. You're not going to have forgiveness of sin without Christ. You're, you're under accusation. You're under all this stuff if you not have Christ. In Christ, you are free. You're free. Choose that freedom. Choose that freedom. We have an enemy, but he's defeated. He's powerless in Christ Jesus. And that, that's good news, isn't it? Receive it. Let's pray together. Father, I pray for anybody who's heard this message today, that they will understand that they are who they are in Christ, that they will be set free in Him. They will have the victory that you have determined that we have in Christ Jesus. I thank you that Christ is all victorious. He's victorious over sin. He's victorious over Satan. He's victorious over all things. And he will rule forever and ever. Thank you for that. We claim that now in Jesus' name. Amen.